Good morning and welcome here. So why am I up here this morning? Is it that I just love to be in front of people with a microphone? No. But Jesus loves me and I believe that he's given me some gifts and he's called me to serve. And I'm here to uh, worship God and I would hear, uh, and I, I guess I would like to lead you guys in worship to him. It's not about me. It's about Jesus, our Savior. And uh, this morning, our, our theme, as I pick songs, would be, well, uh, man, stop talking, Mike. The theme that I used to pick songs was the second coming of Christ. And so I invite you to stand, and we're going to sing the Saints Medley, This Train is Bound for Glory. <laughs>
For scripture this morning, I'll be reading from Acts 1, 7 to 11. These are Jesus' words. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go. trumpet call lift your voice it's a year of jubilee and out of zion till salvation comes behold he comes riding on the clouds shining like the sun at the trumpet call
the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. And holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Amen. Thank you, Mark, for leading and praise and worship team for leading us in those songs this morning. It's always such a good reminder and so good to sing God's praises together as we come here and we focus and reflect and we are reminded on God's truth and who He is and, um, and just how great He is. And He is worthy of our praise. To the church of Bothwell and God the Father and, our, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Good morning, church family. We're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. As you probably know already, it's up on the screen. Um, continuing our series, almost all the way through the book already, and it's been, it's been a good series. There's been a lot... It's, it's a good letter that Paul wrote, obviously. It's God's Word, and it's, um, it's impactful, and it's, it's insightful into the, what the Thessalonians were going through and how Paul reminded them of things and encouraged them and challenged them in things in, in the spiritual sense and encouraged them in the Lord. So this, this passage is a continuation somewhat of the uh, passage we heard last week from Pastor George. Paul had assured the Thessalonians of those believers who have died. In uh, chapter 4, verse 16 to 17, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And so for believers, it is a day of hope. When the Lord returns, it's something exciting to look forward to. But it is a day of God's judgment and wrath for those who reject Christ. There's the reality on both sides. I'll read the passage and then we'll pray together. It says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk, are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. 
Our God and Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for this day that you've given to us. God, we can come here and we can gather as your church, as your people, children of light, children who have been saved from God's wrath. Lord, we can celebrate and we can worship and honor you. And we praise you and we give you the honor and the glory. Thank you for Jesus and the salvation that he has offered to us and that he has given to us for those who have accepted it, Lord. God, as we look into this passage uh, that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, I pray that you would enlighten us, open our, our eyes and our hearts and our minds to receive your word and what it says. Holy Spirit, would you speak to our hearts this morning and, ch and change us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So he starts in this passage by saying, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So when Paul had originally visited, this must have been something that he had taught them, that the day of the Lord would come like a thief in the night. This wasn't new to them. They knew this already. He says the times and seasons, the when and the how it's going to look can become such a distraction to believers. Jesus said in Acts 1, 7, as Mark read, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And in Matthew 24, verse 36, it says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. And he says it will come like a thief in the night. It will be unexpected. You don't know when it will happen. He could come at any moment. The message version puts it this way. I like how it's worded. It says, you know as well as I that the day of the master's coming can't be posted on our calendars. He won't call ahead and make an appointment any more than a burglar would. Paul says they shouldn't concern themselves over this, over when the times and the seasons, this is not what's important. And over the years we've seen and we've heard these predictions of the Lord's return, the day of the Lord's return. And we know that these predictions have not come true. People are trying to decode the scriptures and guess the day of the Lord's return. And some people have gone as far as to follow these predictions and sell their homes and even all their possessions because they were convinced that it was the truth. And even today, and in the last few years, there has been lots of talk and speculation about the end times. Studies on Revelation have taken off and become more popular. And it seems when there's world tragedies and, and things that are happening around the world, people always, they, they think that it's, it's coming soon, and it is coming soon. We don't know how soon, and we don't know when, and we don't know what day it will be. But it is getting closer as time goes on. But we shouldn't be concerned about when it's going to happen. Rather, we should be ready for it. We should always be living in the expectation of his return, living lives of holiness and faithfulness to him. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. And again from the message version, it says, About the time everybody's walking around complacently, congratulating each other, we've sure got it made, now we can take it easy. Suddenly everything will fall apart. It's going to come as suddenly and inescapably as birth pangs to a pregnant woman. There will be destruction. It will come suddenly and there will be no escape, it says, for those who are living apart from Jesus. In Matthew 24, Jesus says, verses 37 to 42, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. 
Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. The phrase day of the Lord is mentioned many other times in the scriptures, and mostly in the Old Testament. Here are a few references. Isaiah 13, verse 6. It says, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. And Amos 5, verse 18 to 20 says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? And Zephaniah 1, verse 7 it says, be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. In verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. A pregnant woman knows that she's going to have the baby at some point, but you don't know when the labor pains will start. It's not announced. You're not told when it's going to start. It could be two weeks after the due date. It could be two months before. You don't know. And it can happen so suddenly, and there's no stopping it until the child is born. You hear a mother's <clears throat> giving birth in a vehicle or at home because they didn't make it to the hospital. And maybe some of you have done that or had that happen. And I'm sure if these people would have known they're going into labor sooner, and wouldn't have made it, they would have left a lot sooner so that they could make it there. It will come suddenly. Verse 4, But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day is to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. And the darkness he is referring to is spiritual darkness. It's without Christ, without faith in God without hope of salvation. For you are all children of light. This is a contrast to those he was just referring to in the previous verse. The Thessalonians should be expecting the Lord Jesus to return. It shouldn't be a surprise when he comes. Yes, they don't know when or which day he's coming, but they should be expecting it because he is coming. He will come back one day. Christmas season is just about here, and some of you will probably watch the movie Home Alone for the 100th time. <laughs> Maybe some of you have already. I wouldn't doubt it. Um, if you've seen the movie, and the first one specifically, but you'll know that Kevin, the main character, was ready for when the burglars came to his house. He was prepared, and he had a plan. Very interesting plan, but he had a plan. He was prepared, and he was ready for them when they came. He knew that they were going to be coming, and it didn't surprise him when they came. And like Kevin, we, should be, we need to be prepared for the coming of Christ. We need to be living our lives in holiness and in faithfulness to him and be prepared and be ready for his coming. <clears throat> it says, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Paul is reminding them, he's telling them of who they are in Christ. They are children of light, children of the day. This is totally different than being children of darkness, being in the darkness. It should be a life transformed in Christ. We shouldn't continue living in our sin and living in darkness, but continue to seek Christ, to live in Him. He is the light of the world. Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
And in John 12, 46 says, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And Colossians 1, 13 to 14 says, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And 1 John 1 verse 5 to 7 says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Paul says and he reminds them that they are children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night nor or of the darkness. And because of that, verse 6, he says, So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us, be, let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. And Paul uses this imagery of not being asleep spiritually, but being awake and sober. To sleep means lack of readiness or laziness, or to be spiritually unaware. When you're sleeping, you're not aware of what's going on around you. And to be awake is the opposite. It's to be alert, to be watchful, to be spiritually aware, to have a heavenly mindset. The word sober is the Greek word nepho, which means to not be drunk, not intoxicated, free from illusion or from the intoxicating influences of sin, like the impact of selfish, selfish passion, greed. It refers to having presence of mind or clear judgment, enabling someone to be self-controlled. It's the opposite of being irrational. And this is similar to what Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, verse 8. It says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And Jesus says, in Matthew 24, 42 to 43, therefore stay awake, for if you do not, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Paul uses this analogy in Romans chapter 13, verse 11 to 12. He says, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Don't sleep spiritually. Be awake. Be on guard. Stand firm. Verse 8, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. Earlier in the, in the letter, in chapter 1, verse 3, Paul uses the same three words. He says, Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And in Corinthians, a familiar passage, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. So he says, Put on these things. Put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Life in Christ is a transformed life. It's a new life. So the breastplate of faith and love, the breastplate protects your vital organs, your heart and your lungs. And this is figurative language that he's using. But these things are essential for keeping us alive. And the helmet of the hope of salvation, helmets protect your head, your brain. It's where you think. It's where your hope is, your hope of salvation. You put your hope in Christ, in your mind. We hope with our minds and we set our minds on things above, 
where Christ is seated, not on earthly things. Set your minds on the eternal hope that you have in Jesus, what he has saved you from, and that one day we will get to go be with him forever. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. In Romans chapter 5, verse 9, Paul says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. He says we're not destined for wrath. God didn't create humanity so that he could satisfy his wrath and his anger. But he is a holy God. Because of sin, God required there to be a sacrifice made for sins. To make a propitiation to satisfy his wrath when sins were committed. And propitiation means that a sin offering by which the wrath of the deity shall be appeased. In the Old Testament, animals were used as the sacrifice for sins. When Jesus came to earth, he was the final sacrifice for sins, once for all. He suffered and died, taking God's wrath upon himself, saving us from it. Romans 3, 23 to 25 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Christ was a propitiation for our sins, and we receive it by faith, by believing in him. God's desire is for people to come to the knowledge of Christ and obtain salvation through faith in Jesus, who died for them. In 2 Peter, we read in chapter 3, verse 8 to 9, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And 1 Timothy 2, 4 to 6 says, Who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. In Romans 6, verse 8 to 11, it says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Again, verse 10 says, Who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. We might live with God eternally. Verse 11, Therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Just as you are doing. This phrase or this idea is repeated elsewhere in the book. They have already been doing this. It's just a reminder for them to keep doing it. Continue to encourage one another and build each other up. In the Bible Knowledge Commentary, it says this. Believers do not need to be hearing something new all the time. But they often do need to remind themselves of what they already know so that they do not forget it. Mutual encouragement and edification are still needed in every local church, and encouragement and edification with reference to their hope in Christ's return is especially needed. I've said this before, but so easily we forget. We get distracted. We need to be reminded. Jess left earlier, this be, earlier than me this morning. She asked me to bring her coffee when I came. I said, if I remember, I will do it. And I, I forgot. <laughs> I think some of you can relate. We are forgetful people. We need reminders, reminders, reminders. And Paul reminds the Thessalonians, continue to encourage one another and build each other up, just as you are doing already. It's not that you're not doing it, but continue to do it. Don't stop. 
And this must be important as we see again else, elsewhere in the letter, he gives them other reminders. Uh, in chapter 3, verse 4, it says, When we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it, as it has come to pass and just as you know. In chapter 4, 1 to 2, it says that you do so more and more for you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. In verse 9 to 10, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that is indeed, that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. In 2 Peter 3, it says, Now this is the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through the apostles. And Paul's reminder to them is to encourage one another and build one another up. One more reference in Hebrews, very similar to this, Paul's reminder is, says, let us hold fast to the confession, confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another, stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Jesus is coming again one day. We don't know when. We don't know the day or the time. But we know he is coming back, and we need to encourage, continue to encourage and challenge one another and build each other up not just here in church. I do hope that when you come here, and I know George and Ron the same, that you are built up in your faith, that you are encouraged and challenged, and that you are appointed to Christ. But we're not just, we don't just do that here. This shouldn't be where it stops. We should grow in our faith outside of these walls and continue to build each other up and encourage one another as we go through our lives, our daily lives. To conclude, three points. Number one, from the passage, um, just a bit of a summary. It says, don't concern yourselves over when the Lord will return. This is a waste of precious time and energy, and we will not know what day it will be until it comes. But rather, my challenge to you is to concern yourselves more with your faithfulness to him and living a godly life, always being ready and expecting his return. Number two, we are not in darkness, but we are children of light. Let that be a reminder. We are God's children, sons and daughters of the Most High God, destined for salvation, saved from God's wrath, let us live lives that reflect this truth. And number three, let us continue to encourage each other and build each other up. Let's remind each other of who we are in Christ, what he has saved us from, and let that be our hope. Continue to remind each other of these things. For those in Christ who have believed in Christ, this is a day, the Lord's return is a day of hope. An expectation for those who have not believed in Christ it is not and we all know people that do not know Christ and aren't following him and I wish it was as easy as telling them to believe and then they would believe but we all have people in our lives there's people all around the world that don't know the hope of Christ and the salvation through Christ and faith in him. And if that's you today, if you don't know him, if there's anyone here that doesn't, if you have not given your life to the Lord, to following him, I would encourage you and challenge you to do that. Come talk to me or one of the pastors after the service, and we'd love to chat with you. 
Life is short. I, I heard a quote or saw a quote. It said something about life is short. We're so concerned about enjoying life, but life is so short. We should rather be concerned about eternity because eternity is long. So church, I pray and I challenge you and encourage you to continue in your faith. Continue to always be on guard. Stand firm and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I will give the benediction and then the worship team will close with a song. It says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. We are going to close with On Jordan's Stormy Banks I Stand. The chorus, I am bound, I am bound for the promised land. Please stand as we conclude the worship service today.
Peace.